religion and what we are about, what we will struggle over. So anybody who is not part of One Struggle, you are welcome, because One Struggle is a collective. We do what our members intend to do, and we engage in struggle what our members feel that they should engage in. So the process is a democratic process in the discussion in One Struggle. And uh, so anybody here is welcome if you're not a member of One Struggle. Today, uh, Abdi, who is a professor and also a member of One Struggle, will be making a presentation on imperialism. I'm pretty sure Abdi's presentation is not the only interpretation of imperialism that exists. There are many other interpretations. But they don't count. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they may not count, they do count, uh, and I'm also, that's the importance of One Struggle. Many people in One Struggle may be in disagreement with his presentation, but and there will be discussion and we will find a level of unity with his presentation in order for us to engage in. So, uh, without any further ado, I am... Leaving the floor with Abdi, that, that will make a presentation on imperialism and his interpretation of imperialism today. Thank you. Thank you, folks. <laughs> Sorry, it took a while for us to get here. It's technological. All right, I'm going to begin with. Uh, <laughs> so let me sort of introduce the direction of how we're going to do this. Um, what I'm trying to do is give a few, uh, I'll, I'll start with a tentative definition of imperialism, and then I'm going to give you a few, probably more than a few, definitions of imperialism, starting with Hobson, you know, going back more than 100 years ago, all the way to people like William Robinson today, and the uh, angry and hard who are the postmodernists, who sort of argue that imperialism the way Lenin um, put it forth no longer exists. Uh, not that empire doesn't exist, but imperialism doesn't exist. Um, so I'll give you that expansive uh, look at the definitions of imperialism for the past probably more than a hundred years. And we'll be able to sort of compare whether it's advanced or hasn't advanced. And also what I want to do is give you my own understanding of imperialism. Uh, some people may call it globalization, or globalization as the new face of imperialism. Some people may call it world capital, or world capitalism. All of this I'll try to clarify and you know, sort of um, delineate what are the different definitions and why are these different concepts um, existing and why are so many people that adhere to them. Uh, I will also delineate the differences in schools of thought, that is, the Marxist view of imperialism, the dependency theory of imperialism, the world system theory of imperialism, and certainly the postmodernist theories of imperialism. And then I will give you some empirical data. That is, I'll show you minimal, you know, don't get afraid, because uh, usually leftists don't like empirical data. They like mm -hmm. concepts. I'm not calling you leftists, but. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so it's not going to be too much empirical data, some statistics on what the world looked like financially and in terms of production uh, during the Fordist capitalist era, which some people call the old imperialist, and what the world looks like today, the post-Fordist capitalist era, which people call the new imperialist, some people call the new imperialism. Um, so I'll make you know that delineation too. And, and so we'll look at some kind of an expansive definition and understanding of imperialism and see where we get. I usually don't do PowerPoints, and I was just tell, telling Danielle this. I think this is a complex subject that should be uh, probably put forth by at least two or three people. That is, one political section, probably one economic section, and one cultural section. And so these three different uh, speakers could talk about each one of those categories. So because it's extensive and it's because it's expansive, uh, I put it in a, I think there are 10 or 11 slides, in a PowerPoint format. I usually don't do this. 
usually meaning I never do it, I, I just like to talk and speak as some of my students who have been in my classes know. But uh, this is to, because I'm giving definition, and I think to, for you to read the definition is more, more important, and then some numbers, and for you to look at those numbers more important and more uh, comprehensive um, than me just telling you and talking about it. So bear with me, let's go through this and see uh, where we can get. This is my own definition. I'm going to come back to it at the very end and ask you what you think. It's very broad. And I try to just use the operative, operative words for an in empirism of the phenomenon. And uh, so, as I say here, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue to be discussed um, if we have time at the end. So, it's the policy to socioeconomically divide and exploit the world between transnational corporations advanced and, uh, advanced and facilitated by states of the poor and periphery. Uh, I think part of what we may have difficulty with, especially knowing some of you and the way you think, is the, the, the latter part of the statement that is facilitated by states of the poor and periphery, because some people may still think, yes. We have too much light in here, we cannot see the screen. Oh, okay. So how about, where did they have the light? There's a switch where? where? Underneath the chalkboard, or the dry erase board, left hand side, my left. Here? Yeah, is that it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. No, no, no. No, no, no. No, no, no. No, Oh. No? Can we strike we a balance? Can't take notes now either. it's kind of hard to take notes. But take some notes. Like mood lighting? Yeah. <laughs> Let's see, there was a switch here. Is there a dinner? <coughs> So can you see it now? Yep. Yeah. All right. Th so this is what I came up with. Again, we'll talk about it. So like I was saying, uh, the difficulty we may have is uh, whether imperialism is facilitated by states of the core, because most people would agree with that, and certainly Lenin's definition. Uh, by the way, I'm going to be referring to Lenin's definition and the five categories of Lenin. Uh, a lot during this presentation, not because I necessarily agree with everything, but because it's probably the most uh, explicable um, definition and explanation of empirism, or at least started that. Because if you read Luxembourg and Hobson and Kautsky and Bukharin and and uh, and uh, others, the contemporaries of Lenin. You see that they did talk about imperialism, but they didn't do it as an extensive the, the way that, that, that Lenin was able to explain everything. It wasn't as extensive a job as, as Lenin did. So I'll, I'll refer to that back and forth. So okay, uh, facilitated by states of the core. Certainly, many people would agree with that, but not necessarily the periphery. So the, many people who are especially nationalists in the periphery countries, or what we call, may call third world, or some people call underdeveloped world, or developing world, think that they are, the states too, are being manipulated, exploited, oppressed, and so on, and they are part of the, uh, the, the bigger picture of the core countries um, oppressing and exploiting them, that is, the states, the state apparatus. All right, so I'll come back to my own definition in the end, see whether it works for you and see how you object to it, or whether you object to it. I'm going to start with Hobson because he's probably the original, not probably, so far as we know, the first guy that used the word imperialism and, and explained it, um, and then, of course, Hilbert. 
free trade world order established under British hegemony in the first half of the century was there to stay in that over time this order would strengthen the tendency towards the suppression of an interstate rivalry over territory, uh, which we still see today uh, somewhat. Instead, in the closing decades of the 19th century, there occurred instead a major resurgence of struggles over territory among the great powers of the state's system, which threatened to destroy the very unity of the world market. So that would be not necessarily something that pops in you know, the first part is not necessarily some, and compared to the second part of the sentence, paragraph, is not something that uh, continued necessarily according to Hobson. Hilferding says imperialism is a fundamental mutation in the processes of accumulation due to three interrelated tendencies. The increasing concentration and centralization of capital, which is also something that Lenin agreed with. The spread of monopolistic practices, also Leninist and the organic domination of finance capital over industrial capital, which we have seen especially grow in the past uh, 100 years, especially in the past 32, 33 years, probably beginning with late 1970s, early 1980s, um, starting with the, the Reagan economy and the Thatcher economy, meaning that's when neoliberalism really took off. And as a result of neoliberalist policies, you see this concentration of finance capital <coughs> and how finance capital has dominated and taken over the world economy compared to productive capital, or capital production, capitalist production. Um, and the organic domination of finance capital over industrial capital, these tendencies, I'll show you numbers because uh, as you will see at the end, about 76% of all of the capitalist movement uh, and assets un under or under finance capital. That's a very large number compared to in the 1960s, 70s, four, five, six percent. So I'll, I'll show you those statistics. Uh, these tendencies heighten um, interstate territorial rivalry. Luxembourg. Uh, we could probably many people use Luxembourg's theory vis-a-vis -vis Lenin and argue that she had a better. Um, definition of imperialism and understanding, but I'll tell you why. In contrast, Luxembourg saw the forcible incorporation of people and territory into processes of capital accumulation as a constant feature of accumulation. So it doesn't matter how much the rivalry is. This is due to the attempts of the agents of capital accumulation to overcome chronic overproduction tendencies. As capitalist overproduction tendency, some people argue, is the real reason why imperialism as a concept started, because uh, capitalist production needed to look for new areas of, uh, of, of investment and market. As, uh, as capitalist development deepened and widened, the pressure to incorporate even more people in territory increased, <coughs> while the availability of people in territory decreased. This is especially true when you look at it today, but again, some people, like uh, those who I said, Negri and Hart, would argue that there are still territories for imperialism to exploit, uh, and they're wondering why that hasn't happened, along with some world systems the theorists who argue that this unequal development will not allow imperialism to invest in, as far as capitalist investment, in these areas that have been underdeveloped. So, Africa for them seems like, or would seem like, an area to really invest in. And everybody's wondering why isn't it that world capital, or world capitalism, or imperialist powers don't rush into Africa. Of course, you see some investing in Africa, but you don't see it as, as extensively as you would see for Asia, South America, or other parts of the world. And if you look at the, the share of the GDP from Africa, the 52, 53 countries in Africa, you compare uh, the share of the world GDP they have today to what they had, let's say, 30 years ago, you'll see a decrease in the share of the GDP. So it went from about 4% in the 1970s to today of 2.7%. So the African country's share of the GDP, world GDP, has decreased, which means that the direct foreign investments or DIOs, DOIs, don't really occur uh, DFI, sorry, don't really occur in Africa as 
um, I guess, unexposed to capitalism as that's been. So th there's, a, there's an argument why that's not happening, sort of theory. So imperialism is the political expression of the accumulation of capital in its competitive struggle of what remains still open in the non-capitalist environment. So an example of that would be African nations, or most African nations, certainly areas like probably uh, North Africa and certainly South Africa, the country, have been exploited a lot by uh, capitalism and imperialism, but not necessarily, I'm not talking about colonialism, but imperialism, but not necessarily the rest of Africa. Kowski, who uh, sort of was to the right of Lenin in this, in this aspect, wrote that the joint tendencies towards the concentrations of capital the spread of monopolistic practices and the organic domination of finance over industrial capital, again, all of the ingredients in Lenin and Luxembourg, would lead to the suppression of interstate territorial rivalries and to the development of what he called ultra-imperialism. Uh, some people argue that by ultra-imperialism, or Kautsky's definition of ultra-imperialism, you may have heard people refer to the phrase of ultra-imperialism, really said that um, at that stage, or ultra-imperialism stage, it wasn't, like Lenin said, the highest or the last stage of capitalism. It was actually a state where we should be looking to go towards. That is, he sort of said it's an advanced state. Imperialism is not a stage of capitalist economy, but a policy preferred by finance capital. So imperialism is the annexation of agrarian countries, countries by industrial countries. So many people argue, if there is a industrial country that takes over the agrarian country, it's a good thing, it's an advancement in their productive system because that's how they would produce a working class by creating industry. Then the working class would increase qualitatively and quantitatively and then take over or become a force and, and take over and overthrow their government and then advance there uh, towards socialism or whatever they thought that was the next stage. So annexation of agrarian countries by industrial countries was a good thing for uh, those who believe in ultra-imperialism. So it's a political phenomenon. Again, I'll talk about why it's a misunderstanding to only think of imperialism as a political phenomenon, or only an economic phenomenon, or as some people have put forth nowadays, cultural, meaning um, the incorporation of the media, especially and electronics. All right, Bukharin, who was the contemporary of Lenin, he would actually, uh, the, the five stages here delineated by Bukharin were, were written in Pravda after Bukharin read Lenin's uh, thesis on imperialism. So he agreed with Lenin, and I say see below meaning Lenin's definition, and modified the five criteria as such. Bukharin claimed that the ruin of bourgeois class was inevitable, uh, again, something that a lot of Marxists and neo-Marxists have been uh, uh, contemplating now and arguing about that is whether it's really inevitable. His definition was uh, state-centered, which left no room for transnational corporations and private sector. Imperialism is a state capital, state capitalism with no room for <coughs> neoliberalism, uh, and that's my own. That's my. That's not referring. Uh, so number one, he says concentration and centralization of capital subjugating the world to finance capital, export of capital, finance capital controls raw material, and policy of conquest of finance capital. Uh, so, all right, so we com let's compare that to Lenin. Lenin, again, probably one of the most exhaustive definitions in works on imperialism, I think, theoretically. Uh, I'm not saying empirically, although he has a lot of empirical data in his book, when he wrote on imperialism, but uh, theoretically probably the most exhaustive uh, work that we know so far. Lenin says, imperialism tendencies did not happen in a political vacuum. They developed under such stress and such pace, with such contradictions, conflicts, and convulsions, not only in the political, but the economic, national, and so on realm. So contrary to Kautsky, Lenin claimed that before the respective national finance capitals will have formed a world union of ultra-imperialism, imperialism will inevitably explode. Some people are saying the inevitable part is a little 
the question hole. Capitalism will, will turn into its opposite. And I think most of us here sort of think as the capitalist uh, destruction or annihilation as inevitable. Uh, but again, this is something that we need to talk about because uh, if we if you dialectically think that nothing social and political is inevitable, then I think capitalism or world capitalism in itself should you know, fit into that dialectical relationship. But nonetheless, uh, we'll talk about the inevitability of, of the explosion and the destruction <coughs> of capitalism um, today and see if that's really something that's happened. Because as you know, uh, Mazzaros, who's, a, who's one of the theorists that writes about world capital extensively, he wrote a book called Beyond Capital, more than a thousand pages. Uh, he argued that later on, in the past eight, nine years, is arguing that we'll either go towards socialism or barbarism. Uh, some people are arguing that we are going towards barbarism or barbarism. So, you know, no light at the end of the tunnel because they think that this inevitability of capitalist explosion and destruction is not really true. Because of the resiliency mainly of capitalism, number one, and number two, the lack of socialist alternatives. Um, worldwide. All right, so for Lenin, five criteria of imperialism are briefly concentration of production. Uh, I, wanna, I want you to take a look at this. Every five of these categories that Lenin talked about and had empirical data for, I have put here and have given you brief data on whether that's continuing or has discontinued. So we'll talk about that. But don't go away. Are you bored yet? No. <laughs> I want to make sure you are. <laughs> but are you with me? Yes. yes. Please tell me if it's if this is monotonous. I get up on this table and dance. It's <laughs> monotonous. <laughs> Could you go back for a second to Kotsky's five things right before London? Sure. That's Bukharin. Kotsky did Bukharin. Oh, Bukharin. That's what I meant. Okay. Is that good? You have five seconds. Done? Yes. You're writing this down, you mean? Yeah. I'll email it to you. Go, go right. write it down. Okay. I'll email this to anybody. Perfect. Else. No, that'd be a great one. So don't, you know, I don't need any of my classes. I don't want anybody to take notes because that's just strange. Um, Is barbarism kind of like neo feudalism? Uh, Neo-feudalism is under barbarism, but uh, not necessarily because barbarism, the way the way they use it, and this is a, this isn't my understanding, but the way they use barbarism is a very small elite group of people of, of the population of the world in complete control of the remaining, let's say, 99 percent. And I don't want to sound like the 90 percent, the 99 percent occupy thing, but you know that's what they mean a very small elite group in complete control of the of a very large population. So the enslavement of the 99% through the even more than 1% of the top. That's what they're calling barbarism. Um, and, and so, you know, no justice, no, in terms of economy, in terms of politics, that's what they mean by barbarism. So going back even probably in some ways, pre-feudal society. Yeah. Um, could it also refer, because I'm thinking of barbarians, to like when the Soviet Union broke up and all of a sudden in Russia you have like gangster capitalists, you know, like big crooked legal and extra legal uh, concentration of power and, you know, loss of the kind of social services people could expect under, under communism. Uh, sure, uh, again, it's under kind of barbarism. Like laws, but not, you know what I mean? But it's, it's, not, it's under barbarism that takes place, sure. Yeah. But not, it's not only, those aren't the only criteria. No, but what I'm saying is that when the um, communist state ended, Russia started having, you know, like elected crooks, unelected crooks, just crooks everywhere. Oh, you mean after 1989? Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, gangs of, uh, you know, like mobsters and stuff. Like people who um, 
Okay, scooped in so and I'll, I'll, I'll come on. back and, and clarify this. But, and I think the only difference between Russia and, for example, here is that their crookedness mm -hmm. or corruption has not yet been legalized. Yeah, that's, but that's why I thought it might be barbarism because they kind of reverted to, you know, extra legal means right. to do so, things. But here, corruption is completely legalized. Oh, so, of course. You know, you have, for example, you know, don't start me because, you know, I have like these other things to talk about. <laughs> so, you know, you have an institution like ALEC that legally tells corporations and state legislature that you can get together and make laws for corporations. That in other countries is illegal. But here it's legal. So you, you legalize corruption and then it doesn't look like it's chaotic or barbaric. But again, it's something that we will come back to. But sure, it's certainly a category of that, that, that chaos that would exist among not the top 1%, or maybe, maybe even less, but uh, the 99%. So OK. Uh, concentration of production, merging of finance, capital with industry. And I want you to think about this. You probably have, since you're a student of imperialism, that is, you've probably studied it a lot before. So concentration of production, again, I'll show you the numbers back then and now, and it has certainly taken place. Merging of finance capital with industry has certainly taken place. Export of capital, somewhat. International monopolies, definitely, and territorial division. We'll talk about that, too. So uh, not yet completely clarified. All right, so these were the old, or, or not, not old in terms of ideas, but in terms of um, terminologically. Of, of definition. So now we come to, I'm going to clarify who all these people are, uh, to the more, more modern definitions or the contemporary definitions of, of, of um, imperialism. So Leslie Sclair says, global capitalism acts within specific institutional <coughs> contexts that cross state borders in economics, polity, and cultural ideology. So, you know, the three categories that imperialism functions under. Imperialism is a way of organizing social life across existing state borders. This is a very important part of her de his definition. Organizing social life. Because most people think of imperialism merely as an economic or merely as a political entity, phenomenon, but it's really an organization of social life. If you think about consumerism, for example, in America as a culture, uh, this has a lot to do with what he's talking about organizing social life. Uh, the way you dress, the way you shop, the way you watch TV, the way you consume anything, whether it's <coughs> news or products, uh, which, which Sclair calls as global <coughs> capitalism. Uh, across existing state borders, and that capitalist globalization is the most important global force, and that socialist globalization, participatory, participatory democracy, globalization of human rights in general, producer-consumer cooperatives, is a viable alternative. So it doesn't leave that viable alternative for us. Um, then uh, Lipiet says, in for I'll tell you what Fordist capitalism is uh, towards the end, because that's a very sort of a controversial way of thinking of, about imperialism. In Fordist capitalism, which is preceding imperialism, and he means uh, preceding uh, not imperialism of the 19th century, but he's talking about pre-World War II, again, I'll tell you why or how. The main source of surplus was not plunder of the third world, but Taylorism and capitalist centers. So Lipiet argues that, um, all right, here, Fordist capitalism is intensive, which means he argues that imperialism before World War II, so before 1945, 46, 47, imperialism was intensive, meaning he doesn't mean exacerbated. He means intensive took place within the core countries. So most of the surplus value extracted by imperialism, even large corporations, corporations that merged, corporations that especially concentrated on finance capital, took place within core countries. So very minimal of the surplus accumulation was from the dominated or the third world countries up until World War II. Now, that's why he says imperialist capitalism after World War II 
which is extensive. That is, that's when it went out and tried to explore the world, and especially, as you will see later on, under neoliberal policies. Okay? Uh, it's, it's a very important distinction that he makes. I'll explain it even more thoroughly after we get to the end. So, so Hart and Negri are sort of postmodernists, not sort of postmodernists, but postmodernists. These are, I don't know if you, you, maybe all of you have read that book, Empire. It's a really thick book. It's a very good book. I, I suggest everybody read. Read it, uh, especially because, forget the analysis, uh, which probably you would end up agreeing with 70-75%, but the data and the concepts in that book, it's called Empire, is excellent. Very good book to read. So they argue that the rise of empire is only the result of labor movements, not objective contradictions of capital. It's a very important uh, idea to put forward. That is, what they're saying is, everything that's happened to world capital and, and imperialism is a dialectical result of what the workers' movement and the social movements have done. Therefore, uh, Negri and Hart are among the Marxists or neo-Marxists who argue, I know I said they're postmodernists, but they're neo-Marxists, who argue that, um, like Marx said before, all of capitalist successes are really their, its failures. So, think about, let's say, Keynesian economy, a success story for capitalism. Think about globalization, neoliberal ideas, a success story for capitalism. But they are arguing that that's really a failure, meaning in the long run, when you look at the results of all of these policies, you see that it will cause a more demise of the capitalist system or the imperialist system, rather than the long-term success. Uh, so empire is a system of global capitalist rule that is altogether different from imperialism because they actually think there's no longer this concept of imperialism pertinent to anything. Imperialism is a nation-less, uh, but led by U.S. with agencies such as WTO, IMF, UN, and G8 on its side. So um, for some reason, mistakenly, just like many other theorists, as I will read to you, mistakenly, um, I say mistakenly because it's a sort of misunderstanding of what Lenin said. They think that Lenin, like Bukharin, argued that imperialism is state-centered. But that's not what Lenin said. And they're just reiterating something of a misunderstanding, I think. David Harvey, of the here. I don't know if I have time, don't worry about it. David Harvey uses Luxembourg's ideas. Overaccumulation produces surplus that cannot be invested within existing boundaries. So, just like Luxembourg like said, the prof profitable ways must be found to absorb capital surpluses. New imperialism is a specific form of primitive accumulation that developed after 1970, so especially with neoliberalism. This is neoliberal imperialism. Imperialism is accumulated by this possession. Okay. What does accumulation by dispossession mean? By taking away from other people. Oh. Taking territory, taking raw material. Got it. Word. <coughs> Want to take a break? Are you tired yet? No. No, seriously, are you with me? Yes. Yeah, with you. It's Please not acknowledge because I don't know what I'm doing unless I get some kind of a... Because I can't see you. When I teach, I can see my students when they doze off, I can tell. Right, you get out, don't sit here. Uh, all right, so Ellen Mikesons Wood says, globalization is imperialism. This is, again, in the contemporary definition of imperialism, because many people are saying globalization is really the new face of imperialism. Imperialism today depends more than ever on a system of multiple nation states dominated by the U.S. So Iraq war is not for oil, but securing global hegemony of U.S. Right? Uh, think about that. You may not agree with the, this latter sentence, but for some people it makes sense. Uh, so, you know, if oil, we can just go and buy the oil, or we can control it through the means of the market. You don't have to militarily go over there and take over and spend two, three trillion dollars to do this. So the reason why Wood argues that uh, the Iraq war happened was for the global hegemony 
of the U.S., especially considering that the U.S. is economically and politically in a decline or in a demise. Yeah, yeah. The only thing I would disagree with that on is the fact that the United States is no longer a, a manufacturing nation. So how could it, ex, you know, it could express its its economic dominance up here when it doesn't make anything to sell them anymore? Um, I don't think she's arguing that. I, but why are you? Why do you think that she's addressing production? I mean, because hegemony could be a political hegemony. Uh, but, you know, let's we'll talk about okay, that. Okay. You know, take your question, or, or, I mean, don't lose sight of, because there's so many definitions you made. All right, so, Bina Cyrus, by the way, uh, I know this guy personally, I've known him for a long time. He uh, was, a, I don't know if you remember, but about three, four weeks ago, Remember when the Argentine government, um, Cristina Hernandez Kirchner, announced that they're nationalizing Argentine oil? Mm -hmm. Remember that? Yeah. Uh, Bina was the main um, consultant to the Argentine state government. They actually, uh, he teaches in uh, Minnesota. So they actually called him or invited him and a couple of other um, leftist economists, especially on the question of oil, because Mina writes especially about oil, uh, to, to consult with them what is good for the future of Argentina to, e to either go with the neoliberal policies and sell and give the oil to multinational corporations or nationalize it. And they ended up through this consultation to actually nationalize it. And I really don't know the you know, outcomes and consequences, but what I'm saying is uh, you know, they, they took his ideas into consideration. So he argues that the post-war development of global capitalism emerged with intranationally within the nation-state boundaries and internationally beyond such boundaries, the complex unity of which can be demonstrated through the following transformations. One, the continuing triumph of capitalism over traditional socioeconomic institutions in the third world, and you could see this even if you go to remote areas of the third world. So you don't even have to go to urban centers and see this capitalist uh, takeover. You can just go to small towns and villages and you see <coughs> how capitalism uh, has reached that far. The continuing development of capitalism in the advanced capitalist countries beyond the nation state, certainly with neoliberalism, eventual disintegration of the Soviet bloc. Uh, some people give a lot of credence to this, this, this um, um, overthrow or the collapse of the Soviet bloc because it made available a wider market for uh, you know this sort of a failing capitalist for, to some people failing capitalist market. The contemporary development of the world is a goal toward a transnationalized socioeconomic order. Today, these interrelated changes are the basis of the as I say, global economy and its corresponding global policy. Okay, William Robinson. We're going to get to the end of the definition. There we go. William Robinson. William Robinson, I don't know if you were here, but he, he came to FIU about a year and a half ago. He had a lecture down south. If any of you know Ron Cox in the oh. Iron Art Department, he invited, he's a good friend with Robinson. Um, he invited Robinson. And he gave a really good talk. Um, unfortunately, there are only from like maybe 30 or 40 people present, but he had a really good lecture when he was here. Imperialism is a global as global capitalism through transnational corporations, transnational capitalist class, transnational state apparatus, and transnational capital, the three criteria. Accordingly, a transnational capitalist class, or what he calls TCC, has emerged, and that, that, that class is a global ruling class. Some people argue that that's not necessarily true, especially given some of these what we call rogue states. You know how they say like the Iranian, and the Syrian, and the Libyan, North Korean sort of countries say that um, you know we're not going to go with this capitalist, the capitalist conspiracy, and we're anti-capital. When I was in Iran about in September of 2008, when this, the nukes 
financial crisis happened. What was funny <coughs> was that the Iranian government was announcing, they said, look, it's clear that socialism has failed. We've known that for years. <laughs> it's socialism? Yeah, with 1989, yeah. Uh, the collapse of the Soviets. It's clear that socialism has failed. It's now clear that capitalism has failed. The only thing that prevails is Islam, you know, as if Islam is an e economic system. And it is, what's funny is you walk in Tehran, the capital of Iran, every other structure is a bank, almost. You know, I, I did this, this is empirical, I did this in a in one kilometer long street in Tehran. I counted 32 banks, about 18 on one side and uh, 12 on the other, uh, 14 on the other, in one kilometer long in a boulevard in Tehran. And these are the people that say, this is Islamic economy. So, socialism has failed, capitalism has failed, Islam has prevailed. So they think of Islam as an economic uh, plan. All right, where are we? Uh, this TCC is in the process of constructing a new global capitalist historic block, a new hegemonic block consisting of various economic and political forces that have become the dominant sector of the ruling class throughout the world, among the developed countries in the north as well as the countries in the south. Uh, the politics and policies of this ruling bloc are conditioned by the new global structure of accumulation and production. <coughs> All right, so these are the categories that I put these theories under. Marxist theories, um, these are good, uh, again, if you want, I can email this to you, but these are good people to know and then study. Um, I also, Jonette, do you have the references? We do. So I also have printed the, the books I've used, not all, but the ones I think are more important, on a piece of paper so you can, I can hand them out, because they're very good to study. So Marxist theories, Booker and Lenin, Kautsky, Luxembourg, dependency theorists, Amin, Barron, Sweezy, Cardoso. Cardoso is the same guy who was the president of Brazil for eight years, remember? He was a dependency theorist. And Gunther Frank, there should be in there, G U N D E R. And then world system theories, Giovanni Arrighi, uh, Bradell, and Wallerstein. Wallerstein really started this school in the 1970s. And liberation theology theorists, Hugo Asman, Enrique Dussel. All right, so these theories, I think, are on this continuum. <coughs> on the left, Empirism no longer exists. There's a discontinuity in, the, in empirism, in the phenomenon, like Negri and Hart with Hart. On the right, empirism is functioning almost the same way. So there's a continuity of the same policies. And as you will see, I'll give, give you some empirical data, um, they've really increased in importance, those five categories that Lenin delineated. And in the middle, there are some people who argue qualitatively transformed, that is, so the qualitative transformation would be less concentration on production necessarily and, and the exploitation of raw material and labor, but more concentration on, let's say, media and communication. And again, I'll show you some numbers for that. All right, so conclusions. Well, how long was this? All right, good. So we'll have questions. So, <laughs> conclusion. Three recent phenomena have accelerated the imperial agenda. So these are my thoughts. Three recent phenomena have accelerated the imperial agenda. Predominance of finance capital. Technological revolution trans information communications. Collapse of the Soviets. Information and media function as new clothes for imperialism, I argue. Uh, I want it to be, I have, I think, all right, so I'll tell you. New imperialism is a new comparison to Fordist capitalism. Um, again, Fordist capitalism is the, the, the capitalism and imperialism that existed before World War II. So inside, it took, accumulation was, was extracted, surplus, surplus value was extracted mostly inside poor countries. Imperialism before 1945 was Fordist, and this is what I mean by Fordist. Nationally regulated economy, 
formal decolonization, mass production, mass consumption, um, which is Keynesian. I'll explain to you what that means. Regulated, regulation of world trade, regulation of exchange of currencies, welfare state, and Fordism after World War II functioned in the form of Cold War protection. Uh, as you know, with the Keynesian economy, because Keynes argued uh, you know, with the failing capitalist structure and institutions, he said, look, the problem is that you guys are emphasizing saving, whereas you should be emphasizing consumption. So put money in the hands of the people so they will end up consuming. That's how we will, um, we will um, protect capitalism. That's how capitalism will stay alive. Today, people are questioning that, and I mean economists, not just lay people, are questioning that and saying we should go back to saving instead of consuming. So, I mean, saving, consuming has always been an ethos for the American, um, uh, American capitalist accumulation and American culture. Uh, if you look at, for example, Protestant ethics, Protestant ethics consistently argues that you should save money. Don't spend it. You know, live an aesthetic life frugal life. Don't spend it where you don't need it. Delay gratification. Whereas with Keynesian ideas, it was the opposite. Spend your money even when you look at the 1970s, 1980s, all of a sudden the credit card, that is spend the money you don't have, uh, you know, borrowed from other people, but certainly consume. And that's how we got to this red economy. Red, not leftist, but red as in indebted. <coughs> That's funny that the correlation in colors between leftists and indebtedness. Hmm. I never thought about that. New imperialist changes. Capitalist, capital concentration shapes finance, industry, and services. Finance capital is a dominant form of capital, which is 76% of total capital assets in the world, which is really, really large. Capital export far more important than 1945, 1975. U.S. lost in exports. Um, right now, U.S. ranks third as a region in exports and imports. So number one is Europe, contrary to what many people think, or at least perceive now. Number one is Europe, the 27 countries of the EU. Number two is China, both in terms of import and export. And then number three as a region is uh, U.S. China number one in import, ooh, I just said import, export. All right, so let me show you these numbers and I'm done. Look, uh, I took the five categories of Lenin and put some, and put some uh, numbers next to it. Where's the fifth? Right here, concentration of production. Look at the merger and M&A. M&A is mergers and acquisitions. Large companies eating up the small. Uh, from $74 billion in 1987 to $1.1 billion in 2011. These are UN numbers. Merging of finance capital with industry. 5.3% of GDP in 1980, 86% of GDP in 2007. Um, capital export. Core exports, imports, a share of GDP, 10% in 1965, 26% in, not a really big change, but somewhat of a change, 2007. International Is that for the whole world? Okay. Yeah. Okay. International monopolies, if you look at the, there is a difference between, so you, there's a category that, that delineates first world, so, you know, developed world, developing world, and then you'll see that the numbers correspond with almost the same, same thing. Uh, so average 10%, 26%. International monopolies, 0 0.3 tenths of a percent in 1970, uh, which is 64% of FDI, foreign direct investment. Excluding China, it goes to Europe, um, uh, both North, North Europe and West Europe, and US. So most of the exporting, importing in the world Except for if you take away China, it's to Europe and, and the US. All right, so I read that 495 companies that are listed under the categories banking and diversified financials in the Forbes 2000 list of the world's biggest companies in 2000. 
2018. 100 of them, or 20%, are from the U.S., 114 from the European Union, and 178 from Asia, um, which includes China, Hong Kong, India, Indonesia, Japan, Malaysia, Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, Thailand. This shows that there's not an American finance empire, despite what many people think. But there is there's a military American empire, but not a finance American empire. There's rather an American military empire, 48% of all military spending in the world. So uh, military spending of all of the countries put together in the world equal the military spending of the US in this case. All right? So that's it. bunch of men together like at the UN or something and I see them wearing suits and ties all over the world when they're having business meetings or summits or whatever maybe sometimes once in a while a guy will have on a headdress from this country but the fact that suits and ties are standard business attire all over the world to me basically says the you know Anglo-Eurocentric uh, imperialism has won because that's such a cultural shift to wear something uncomfortable, say like in a hot country instead of like a big white flowy thing. You know? And just to see that everybody buys into, like we have to look like the Americans, we have to look like the Europeans. Um, I think that, you know, uh, you know I, I always notice the cultural things or like how like spam is real popular in, Ho in Hawaii where people are getting really unhealthy from it. And, just this kind of export all over the world of uh, American and European um, food, religion, ways of being, you know, and that was touched on it in your lecture. I just kind of noticed those external signs, um, and it's internalized, you know. If you have to show up at a meeting and you feel like you have to wear a suit and tie, or you're eating McDonald's in China and all of a sudden, or Japan, you're getting sick because you're not eating like a healthier diet that you're eating an American diet. Um, that's like the stamp of imperialism that's so deep in people. I don't even know if, like, you notice it if it's something you've been doing just steadily and if it's steadily eroding your traditional other ways. But that's kind of, um, it's keeping your mind in lockstep as well as your finances and Right, I think, so, so if, if I was to sort of formulate what you said, I would probably say that if you read uh, Baudrillard's, Jean Baudrillard, G-E-A-N, Baudrillard, B-A-U-D-R-I-L-L-A-R-D, uh, he's a French, I'll spell it later, uh, he's a French sociologist, he wrote a book called Consumerism. So then he, he talks about how actually production becomes culture. So it goes from what's being produced to what we use without even, like you said, thinking about it, whether it's, it's consuming a burger at McDonald's or wearing a suit and tie in these international meetings. So really, we have no say-so uh, in terms of even <coughs> what we consume, because it seems like there's no choice in consumption. Uh, the choices are pretty much limited to what corporations uh, produce for us. So I mean, even the alternative to the alternative is not an alternative. Do you, you know what I mean? Yes. So, I mean? So your alternative to Publix is Whole Foods, but Whole Foods is Publix. Hmm. You know, in, 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 that, in that sort of ironic sense, the alternative is not even an alternative. It's within still the framework of consumption. Or U gas is an alternative alternative to Amico, and it still. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is on a different topic. This question was raised before when you mentioned that the U.S. went to Iraq, not just for oil. And I agree that's a simplistic um, interpretation, but for global hegemony. 
the question is, you know, why global hegemony? I mean, is this an end or, or a means? Uh, it, it, it's this is Claire's idea. So Claire argues that um, it's hegemony that U.S. is after because it feels that it's in a demise since the early 1980s. So what they have lost in terms of economic, political hegemony, they're making up for in military hegemony. Um, if you if you look at, for example, the military budget, American you, military you, budget. You mentioned that at the end. Right. In, 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 in 1989, right, so the, collect, the end of the, war, the Cold War, right, was about $250 billion, $248 billion, right? Today, with the um, discretionary budget included, U.S. spends about $1.1 trillion on its military. Despite the fact that they're saying, so after the Cold War, we're going to we're going to have dividends, extra money to spend in society, right, in education, health, and, so on. and it not only did it not happen, but it expanded and increased by about 400 percent now. So the reason is because, according to Square, is because there's been a strong economic, political demise, decline of the U.S., and it's making up for that demise through its military power. It's going to cost it more. Right, but it's in terms of production. So we're, we're producing stuff and it's helping the economy. Look, the difference between, and, and I understand that, but the diff if you look at the 12, 13 years of Vietnam War, mm -hmm. and if you look at the positions taken by American unions, like AFL-CIO, mm -hmm. or most unions, they were all pro-war. They said war is a good thing. Why is war a good thing? Because it employs Americans. So we don't care what's happening over there as long as we produce stuff, right? So in that sense, in the 1960s, some of the 70s, the idea made sense in, in a nationalist way right? for, for workers to say, or for unions to say that. Today, I don't mean made sense for me. You know, mm -hmm. it made sense for them. Uh, today, you don't see unions holding that position. Because despite this production of military expansion, right, most of the production, except for some minimal um, high profile and, and, and sort of uh, uh, secretive kind of weapons that they cannot afford to have other people produce, most of the stuff is not being produced even by American uh, factories or Amer American uh, workers. So in that sense, there is profits to be realized, but profits in the hands of a very small number of people. As opposed to the 1960s, it was profits to be realized, but in the hands of some workers. So, you know, wages were high, or employment due to war, a war economy it was called. And a war economy worked for a rather a larger population. Today, that same war economy, as profitable as it has become, uh, doesn't, as they say, trickle down, which is a term that makes you feel like you're being peed on. But, it, you know, it doesn't trickle down. So, it's true, like you said, it, I mean, it, it, it's expensive and it takes expense, but as a result, uh, it's money in the hands of these TNCs that I was talking about. So this is Sclair's, you know, strictly Sclair's idea, that the demise in economic and political realm has contributed into the American expansion, expansion of American militarism. And so war really is not for Iraq war, it's not for oil, it's for hegemony. Mm -hmm. Now, many people even argue that with uh, Afghanistan, what we did in Libya, you know, Vietnam, or, or Sudan right now, or Somalia, countries that we don't hear from nowadays. Uh, hear from meaning on the Mainstream media. Mm. Rich. Yeah, and um, your only definition that you said was yours, you said imperialism is a policy to divide and exploit the world between transnational corporations. Yeah, I said Advanced that. and facilitated by core and periphery. I'm trying to figure out core periphery states. I'm trying to understand why you use the word policy. It's like you're flying as if there's, that it's just something that the bourgeoisie or the, a faction of them just. That does not has, that doesn't have good. to do with At concentration. Somebody caught it. What I mean is, 
and that's, that's why it follows immediately by socio-economical. Uh, I don't mean imperialism is political, because as I read you some of the definitions, some people think imperialism is a political phenomenon. I don't think imperialism is a political phenomenon. The reason I say it's a policy for socio-economic divide is because you could replace the word theory or plan or program or agenda for policy. I don't mean political by saying policy. I mean policy as a program to socioeconomically divide. A plan or a conspiracy, I don't know. <laughs> Whatever you want to call it. I didn't mean by the word policy, I didn't mean political. It's it's not capital P. Yes. Did I answer your question, Rich? Uh, somewhat. Uh, I but I mean, go ahead. So, let me, maybe I can clarify. I'll get back to you. I got to All right. Um, I want to ask about uh, Hart and Negri, the idea that imperialism doesn't exist, I guess, in the way that it used to. I guess, whatever their argument is, um, and you use Africa as an example where there's since it hasn't been fully exploited by capital and doesn't seem to be. Um, I'm not sure what the numbers are on it, but in the past few years, there's been a lot of stories about China going into Africa where uh, America and Europe haven't been. And I want to know is, from your understanding of their theory, do they, do they take this into account? <laughs> or do they think that this phenomenon is maybe overstated? Or are they excluding it for some reason? It's the phenomenon of China, of investing, China in Africa. investing in Africa as opposed to traditional like European or American companies. Um, if you look at the numbers uh, in terms of imperialism, so in terms of uh, the export of capital, in terms of uh, using the raw material and labor, cheap labor in countries that usually uh, we would think of the reason or the way imperialism started, you would see that China's investment in real estate, mostly, in Africa, doesn't necessarily make one conclude that it's an imperialistic uh, move. Uh, most people think of that as something that China is looking to do for the future and non-imperialistic necessarily, because most people don't even think of China as an imperialistic uh, power. Uh, I, I'm not going to argue whether it is or not right now, because I'm probably not prepared to do that. Uh, but nonetheless, they don't look at Chinese investment in Africa as the way, for example, the U.S. invested in South America or Central America, which would be under the category of imperialist move. What, uh, what, what so they're the not looking to they're not looking to exploit raw material material or cheap labor, or they're not looking to export their um, their uh, goods over there. Look, one of the reasons why. Uh, so, so let me backtrack. Um, there's a lot of argument by many leftists and you know conservatives who argue that look if the problem of capitalism is structural. Right? meaning that there are no areas of investment, that uh, the accumulation of surplus has come to a point where we can't afford any more accumulation, right? because the more you accumulate, the, higher, the lower the prices, the more you accumulate wealth, the lower the currency value. Um, so why don't we exploit these areas that have not been exploited yet, namely Africa? Like I said, if you travel to Africa, you'll see that uh, you don't have to travel, just read about it. You see that there are great areas, and I mean like millions and millions of acres of land and also cheap labor that have not been, not been exploited by, by uh, corporations, as you can see. So this is a new area for investment. We can do it, right? We can go there, and we as in corporations, states, we can go there and, and do what we did in the Middle East, what we did in a East Asia, what we did in South America. That is an argument. Uh, but then again, the, the argument against that is because, like I said, the last thing capitalist economy needs today, or world capital needs today, is more production. And that's why you know, there's, there's stagnation, or decline, or recession because they don't want to produce anymore. The more they produce, 
the higher the rate of uh, 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 economic crisis. Right? So some people are arguing we can, some people are saying we can't. But uh, I only gave that as an example because some people say that despite what Negri says, or Hart and Negri say, that everything is now, uh, uh, is now exploited in the, in the world. By imperialism, there are still areas that haven't been. I'm not saying that's Negri's argument. I'm saying that's a counter-argument to Negri. Okay, I'm, I think I'm more confused now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Negri are, they, and are Hart they making the argument that, uh, I, from what I, what I took from that was that they're making the argument that imperialism as such doesn't exist anymore because this example of Africa being this vast area that hasn't been exploited yet. No, no, no. That is not being it doesn't exist anymore because it prevails in every corner of the world. Oh, okay. So the counter argument to that right. would be Africa. Right. Okay. So people who disagree with them say, oh, look, there are regions in the world that you cannot go and show um, capitalist accumulation. They're st strictly untouched and some, you know, pre feudal even relations exist. Not even feudal, or not even, you know, primitive accumulation or primitive uh, capitalism. Right. Right. Stephen. Um, just about that specifically, um, the Negri argument that Hart capital and finance capital, there is also struggle. In a sense, it's not a mechanical type of fusion. And what happened in, in Africa or different countries in Caribbean, it's a reflection also of that struggle. Uh, you, could, you could see here that also in the United States. And that's why I think the problem in the United States is more structural than cyclical. In a sense, there are struggle between uh, the concentration of capital speculative aspect of capital and the struggle between industrial capital. Uh, and that will make also their choice in what they're going to do with Africa or with Haiti or with all, any other countries. And I think at different moments of cap, of cap imperialism, there were different concentration of capital that were, I think for me, hegemony. Uh, in a sense, you know, in the 1800s where uh, mercantile capitalism was dominant and they imposed their rule you know, globally, and <coughs> when industrial capital was dominant, you will see the same thing happen. For example, you will go to, to Haiti, since I'm from Haiti, I know about it, they will invest in industries, totally connected to imperialist needs. Uh, in a sense, they will invest into agricultural, pineapple, plantation, all this, and some level of mines, bauxite, and everything else. And now, and if everybody wants to know barbarism, just buy an airplane ticket and go to Haiti. <laughs> and we will see barbarism uh, in a sense now because of finance capital. They are no longer interested into those things, uh, into industry. So many things that are happening now in Haiti is speculation. For example, Clinton made 33 cents on a dollar. Every dollar that goes to Haiti, they, they, the Clinton Foundation makes 33 cents. So in the finance capital, there is money to be made. Doesn't mean also the this, the distribution of worldwide you know exploitation doesn't exist. For example, they do see Haiti as a form where textile is important to them, so they will invest into industrial industry to make you know jeans and everything else. But it is not mechanical. I don't think the fusion between those different forms of concentration of capital that give us imperialism is that mechanical. There are struggle among the capitalist class itself that exists, <coughs> and it is worldwide. It is also in the United States. We could see it in the country between the Democrat and the Republican, even though all of them are intertwined. But I think that element 
is to be considered. We cannot talk about imperialism without looking at that, those elements that exist in the concrete, in reality, and, and also conflict that could even go into a very antagonistic solution. You know, in, that could even lead to war. And for I Iraq, I think one of the problems, I do agree with you on that concept, because I think Saddam was trying to change, put the dollar on the side and put as an international monetary exchange using, I think, the euros instead of the dollar. It was not about war, it was actually about a political imposition of political hegemony on that part of the world for the dollar to remain the main international currency of exchange. Or at least for oil. Yeah, let me yeah. go back to let me go back to your the first point you raised. I I tend to think, like I said, 76, 77 point, 75 point eight percent of um, all assets in the world belong to finance capital. It's a huge number. Now, how has that happened? Not through the prevalence of finance capital over in industry, but by industry deciding to do so. So therefore, GM and GE, who are main producers in the world of products, decide to become finance capitalists. All right? So where's the contradiction? I do believe at the same time, you can probably show in pockets of the world the contradiction between industry and finance capital, and you can see that probably industry is struggling because finance capital is taking over in terms of you know what prevails. But I think the reason why we see 76% of assets in the hands of finance capitalists is because industry decided to do so because they had no other uh, corners or areas to invest in or, or produce for. So when you don't have areas to produce for, and even when raw material and cheap labor is available, say, I don't want it because more production is disadvantageous to me, that's when you go to finance capital. That's why I think uh, banks, you know, the, the deregulation of stuff, the neoliberalist uh, finance policies, which Reagan and Thatcher, you know, worldwide started. But I don't, I'm not saying that the contradiction you raised it doesn't exist. All I'm saying is that if you wanted to look at this as a world phenomenon, you will see that the reason why finance capital is, is advanced so much is because industry decided to do so. Yeah, but that's the tendency of imperialism. Even though if industry, it's why it's going to happen to China also. Even though now they are very invested into an industry, but their tendency, that what exists in the society itself, will lead them to imperialism will lead them to develop well with the hegemony of finance capital. What I'm, what I'm insisting on is that we need, in the process, we need to recognize it exists. Look yeah. what just happened this week uh, with uh, the ban investment, the one that Romney had, where you know the Democrat went against him, and one Democrat said, I'm not touching this. Because this is where the union invests their uh, fund, their retirement fund. And it showed clearly, even though those guys are looking for jobs, they are going after Romney for killing American jobs. But at the same time, all of them are invested into the banned financial capital fund. Which, and this guy, a cocky from New Jersey, says, hey, this is crazy, I'm not touching this. But it showed the, the, the contradiction capitalism is under now, where they want to go back to create jobs. In order for them to create jobs, they got to go against finance capital. But you know, for them to go finance capital, they have to cut their own umbilical cord also. So that's the contradiction. And this, and this is why, you know, it is not only a cyclical aspect, but it is now a structural aspect. Because they have to cut their own head. To resolve the problem that exists, the crisis that exists now, they have to cut their own head. The same thing happened in Haiti. But I think, for example, in Africa, imperialism used Africa the, what, which they used to use Haiti in the 1960s for uh, speculation in other form, on, mostly on health. They go there and test. For example, they, want, they were testing uh, 
uh, contraceptive, they will go to Haiti and test it. And with all the NGO, they will go and test the contraceptive, and then after that, the capitalists who control it will be able to invest it, with speculating on, the, on those things. And they are doing the same thing in Africa. Gates is doing the same thing. The guy souls that everybody call a, a popular, a progressive millionaire, that's what he's doing in Haiti. You know, to a bunch of NGO. They test those medicine and they test it with the Haitian. The Catholic Church, who is against abortion, they started with their NGO in Haiti testing contraceptive. You know? <laughs> and that's what they are doing. So I think based on the international division of labor, imperialism in use some countries for different specific aspects. You know, and then from those things they use them. Maybe they may change their policy later down the line, but they will use them to achieve certain goal for their own accumulation. You know, and the last thing I'd like to say is that imperialism is not a social process, it's not a social thing, but I think the accumulation aspect of it, the surplus value aspect of it, is a social process. That's what leads us to consumerism or the contradiction among imperialism or capitalism. If, you know, looking at this, like, like this, will lead us to a very reformist orientation. But if we look at the fact that the production of surplus value, the extraction of surplus value, is the social process of capital. That's the, more, that's the core of capital, whether it's take the form of imperialism or not. It's, that's the one we should go after. Yeah. Not because imperialism, anybody could be a time imperialist, but to go after the production of surplus value is the core, the fundamental aspect of it. I just want to go back, I agree with you, I just want to go back and sort of mention that the reason, like I said, Marx argues that all of capitalist successes are really its failures of reverting to or changing to finance capital as the, as the main mode of pro profit is another one of those successes, which really will contribute heavily into its demise, yeah, as we saw in this, in this I like last make, few years. I'm a member of one that I recommend there's a newspaper. Anybody who have friends who may be interested could take some newspaper and circulate it among them, because we need people to read those ideas. And also, we are doing uh, a presentation on April side on June 16, here in the same room. If also you have a friend that you know that may be interested, you could take some. We have some postcards you have distributed to them, and the newspaper as well. And one of the reasons we're doing that activity was on the July 26th to July 29th. We will be doing an activity on imperialism. There will be different people talking about the effect on imperialism in their own country, and Haiti, Iran, and there will be other countries that will be involved, that we'll be talking about. And it's also in in commemoration of the first Haitian occupation, July 28, which actually changed the course of Haiti. And hmm? 1915. Yes, and uh, which actually caused which changed the course of Haiti and which Haiti in a situation of barbarism at this time. So there will be a series of activities done during July 26 till July 29. Yes. Uh, okay. Um, well, it's a pretty grim picture, not a very sunny picture, is it? And um, and it's a talking of hegemony. I just moved in from Bangladesh. I, I go there. So talking of hegemony, even the political process of governance, even if somebody wants to talk, they will look at U.S. and say, "Hey, what what do you approve?" And then go for that. And um, I guess. This entire hegemony is is in the minds more over there. Uh, everywhere, I mean, where you where you accept the supremacy of of this imperialism. I mean, I lived in Iran twenty years ago, and there at that time they would say, "Odame America bade, religionse America khobe." So the consumerism. Okay, today. I understood that. That's what we are sure <laughs> Oh, which means that Americans are bad, but American products are good. <laughs> that's 20 years ago. So, so that's how it sells, um, which, is, which is a grim picture. And this whole uh, military thing and, and this 
eerie way of giving a human face to military everywhere and it's going trickling, as you say, into countries where I come from. It's, it's scary. But while you were speaking, you just mentioned once Argentina. So I mean, your <coughs> personal view, is, is, is there some places things, I mean, there are, are places still there where you one could observe cautiously and see what's happening? Is, is certain nuances difference in some places that we don't have to really sit down and put our... <laughs> and you mean, are there, are there yeah, um, exceptions it, to this hegemonic uh, rule of... Imperial? Yes, which... which uh, Argentina like, coincidentally started when their crisis in 2006, was it? The first time, 2002, 2003, when their currency oh. <coughs> declined. Well, they started the, as a pocket, as, a, as, an, as, a, as an exception to this rule. They started, and I mean in vast areas of Argentina, bartering. <coughs> so instead, so there was a market. So instead of you bringing money to the market to buy your stuff, you would bring Probably. goods. So you would barter, let's say, a jacket you had for, I don't know, a few pounds of food or what have you, uh, which, which was quite successful, and I think in still it goes on in some areas of Argentina, but, uh, you know, flew in the face of many of these companies and corporations that hated something like that to happen, because forget the fact that it's short-lived. That's yeah. not a problem for them, or that's not the point. The point is, it becomes a possibility. You know, living a life without money, without that perfect object, or what I call the visible God, is, you know, is possible. And when corporations realize That's that... That's scary for them. Right. So people can think of those alternatives. Or, again, in Argentina, um, a few factories, right, yeah. were shut down. So what the workers of those factories decided to do was, all right, so... You know, you're the owner, you've left, you've, you're bankrupt, go away. They picked up production and started to produce on their own and sharing the profits and so on. So again, it's a possibility. Uh, what's happening is, especially with this World Socialist Forum, that there are entities in the world that are teaching about the possibilities. And look, one of the reasons why, and I, I don't want to make this complicated, but maybe it becomes more clear than complicated if I explain it. One of the reasons why um, um, I'm more tending towards theory than empirical data, that is, to think about things and contemplate about things, is because then you can think about possibilities. But if you want to empirically show things, you know, say, show me a country that, you know, socialist relationships exist. Empirically, I can't show you. But can we think about it, right? Is it a concept? Are human beings capable of creating those kinds of relationships again? That's the important part. Because, uh, you know, in the past 30, 40 years, like you said, people have become so cynical uh, about alternatives to the mainstream. And, all right, I might as well just give up. And as Margaret Thatcher said famously, you know, she called it Tina. There is no alternative. So don't even go after it. Don't think about it. Because it's as it's what there. Fukuyama said, it's as good as it gets. The end of history, right? If we have problems, only capitalism can address it. And only capitalism can uh, correct it. Outside of this, it doesn't exist. But if we think about the anti-Fukuyama and anti-Thatcher idea, then we can see that these pockets do exist, and people have done it, and you know, it's a, it's a possibility. So yes, there are pockets in different parts of the world, but unfortunately, you and me, because our source of information is mostly mainstream media, I'm not, I, don't, I don't mean you and me, but you know, in general, yeah. and people don't know about those alternatives, people don't know about those relationships. That doesn't, like Daniel said, include the process of surplus accumulation. You know, you produce for me and let me get rich while you get poorer. Other relationships with that doesn't exist. You produce for your own good, and I produce for my own good. You know, as a community. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah.
imperialism, is, it, it, to me, imperialism has always been about more than just one level. Imperialism, you can't say like, in the Middle East it was about U.S. homogeny, right? Hegemony, huh? Excuse me, hegemony. We went into... Although they do try to homogenize. Yeah, but... Right. <laughs> I remember when we first went into Iraq, the an acronym for the operation was going to be Operation Iraqi Liberation, Liberation right. right? So they changed it after they realized what that spelled out to Operation Iraq, Iraqi Freedom. But when you look at U.S. imperialism, it's always been on multiple levels. It's it's not, it is about oil, but it's not just about oil. It is about profits, but it's not always about profits. It is about U.S. domination politically or, you know, whatever. And I'm seeing the same thing, you know, like what happened in, in, in the Middle East. It was about securing the largest oil reserves in the world. It was also about strategic positioning of U.S. military, the old mentality that the United States had since the and the World War II, which was encircled, in which we had operations going on in Afghanistan and operations going on in Iraq, and who was in the middle was Iran. That way, you kept the pressure on, you know, you had the situation in Iran, I mean, Iraq, getting rid of Saddam Hussein, which was a problem to the Americans, then Afghanistan, but also by being in those two countries, put pressure on Iran. Again, going back to the old times of the Soviet Union and how the United States encircled the Soviet Union and, and in the Pacific it was China. So, I don't think there is just one definition when it comes to imperialism, I think. Yeah, I, 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 the reason why, <laughs> from all of the definitions that I read to you, I'm not comparing myself to these big names in theory, but I try to sim simplify the definition. And I certainly agree with you. It's multi-layered. That's why everybody that talks about imperialism as a, as, a, you know, as a phenomenon, you have to talk about very different layers. Is it economic? Is it political? Is it culture? Is it religion sometimes? You know, is it communication? Is it electronic? You, you do have to talk about all of these layers. And certainly, like you said, I think there are contradictions even within, just like any phenomenon, within imperialism. So right, it, one, one side says, for example, yes, it makes sense to, you know, the Heritage Foundation or the new uh, project for American Century, militarily attack and bring democracy over there. The other says, no, we need to create a market. So yes, within imperialism, there are or contradictions, and you have to pay attention to all of them. Right? And, I mean, the the examples were: look how much profit was made by certain corporations that were were like almost pre-designated <coughs> to assist in the war in Iraq, the right. Halliburton and Bechtel. I mean, there was no biddings going on for whatever, and these companies came out of with billions of dollars in profit. Right. Like I said, that's a process which I call legal corruption, as opposed to illegal. If this took place somewhere else, it would be illegal. Right. But here is part of the. So yeah, I, I, that's only sophisticated only... barbarism. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and now you have the Godfather in Washington deciding who's going to be assassinated and who isn't going to be assassinated. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so. um, about the. Bit. It, it was a follow up from that, that lady there. Yeah. I think uh, for me, <coughs> everything that comes, the new society, everything that we do here, there is element, there, is, there are tendencies that exist in, in this, what we are living now, that will go to the next one. We can't just break it away. Uh, but there is one thing central. I think there is a French intellectual named Badiou that called Talk of Communist of Movement. Meaning, from my interpretation of communist of movement, are all those tendencies that exist and and the people trying to resolve or address capitalism, all those tendencies that exist will are, are the the the, the tendencies that will actually.
actually be the embryo of the new society that is coming up. It will eventually come up that it's not one thing. Now I'm not talking about a representative of one struggle. There is one thing that will be essential. It will be a revolution. It will be a, a radical change. Because you cannot have, in fact, the Argentine, uh, the Mont Dragon experience. Now all those workers are sitting down because their main so, uh, people that were, their main buy was the state. And the state decided not to buy from them anymore. So they're all sitting down under, behind the machine and wait for another to come in. So I think anything that is done under capitalism is bound to be replicated by capitalism. Uh, the exchange of the barbarism that exists, capitalism will call it something else. They will exist, they will be there. In fact, the end, the Black Panther came with the community health. Now we have NGO. And the capitalism will take, grab anything that exists, that's in their nature to do it, and make them become part of their system. Unless we recognize there should be a radical change, a radical breakup, uh, a rupture between this old system and the new one. And uh, the, the, the correlation between the two it will be a, a, a revolution, a radical transformation of the society that will actually, those tendencies will become part of the new society that we are building. Because it cannot exist. The workers in England since 1800, well, that's experience that is happening now in Argentina, we're doing the same experience in, in, in England, in the 1800s. And if capitalism took it, ate it, and digested it, and make it something new. For the, for, again, for the, for the, the surplus value production. So it will not, unless we recognize, there are two things, there will need to be a mass movement that stop them from or accumulating capital and accumulating surplus value. That's a mass movement where we actually struggle on the street, workers asking for wages, and creating, by demanding those demands, we are creating their own contradiction. Because the, way, the reason they have war, the reason they have an army, is because they have the money. So if we don't develop a line that stop them from having that money to be able to build whatever they want, the FIU is part of that action. They're killing other people. <laughs> you know, that's why they have a fight. It's them killing other people that we could come to a school and, uh, and do that with AAC uh, every day. But we need to understand that's the, 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 the contradiction we have to face, and there need to be change. One, we need to build a mass movement where people, students, workers, everybody, every people that are under domination need to struggle and stand up for their rights. And at the same time, there need to be a radical change. Yes, I know. Um, about the accumul more accumulation leading to lower prices, why can't the cartels, the big companies, why can't they just get together and fix prices? I mean, I know it's illegal. They do. They do. <laughs> they do. <laughs> but why can't that be a solution if they're, um, to, to not letting more accumulation lead to lower prices? For them, I'm saying. As long as there's production. First of all, what they do now, despite what some of the arguments were earlier in the 20th century, is monopolies. In fact, I, I gave a talk about monopolies before, but uh, Marx used to argue that monopoly competition will allow prices to get lower and lower and lower. Uh, but I think you right mean now, one monopoly competing against another right. monopoly? Okay. Um, but now what we face are oligopolies. Mm -hmm. Exactly what you just mentioned. Monopolies coming together, working together in order to fix prices. That's exactly what they do. But again, this is not a solution. The solution of... Wouldn't it be a solution for them? It's, it's a solution for the market. It's not a solution for production. Okay. The problem capitalist accumulation faces now is production. They can't afford to produce anymore. I didn't because say, there's too much stuff? Because there's already an over-accumulation of both products and wealth. Look, uh, China in itself, I, I gave this example once before. China in itself, there's one small town in China that produces 33% of all of the socks produced in the world. Right? right? Now, can you imagine if you have 
five of these towns in the world? Or 200 of these towns in the world? What's going to happen to the overaccumulation of these socks? The only thing that can happen is the reduction of the price. Or they just make them to get holes really fast. So <laughs> Sock puppets, maybe. So, or, for example, uh, but why does you ever the price have to go down? Turbines, That's stuck, right? Wind there. turbines are 78% produced in China. Uh -huh. Can any other country pick up on that production? No, because then there will be an over accumulated product. So this is true. Right now, the world buys about 38 million cars, new cars a year. But they produce 70 million cars a year. No. So do you understand? There's already oh, okay. an overproduction of many, many, or most products in the world. And that's the reason why there is the original, there is the essential reason why there is so much crisis is because of that. Can we afford to go to Africa and these untouched, undeveloped country, countries in the world and produce more? No, because we have to set up shop. And everything capitalism does produces profits, which means more money now. Again, the reason why the crisis, this new crisis started was because there was too much money in the hands of very few, not because there wasn't enough money. Okay, one understanding I have of capitalism is that it always needs new markets. It needs, you know, like say when it went to Vietnam, it wasn't just about getting the raw materials and the labor, it was also about getting sure like Vietnamese people bought Coca-Cola and McDonald's and, and so on. And of course now, you know, there is all this cheap production going on there. So are the markets, the places to expand, are they just running out on the globe because we've had capitalism for about 200 years? That, yeah, it doesn't look that way, but look, this is a little bit more fundamental than just imperative. There is a contradiction that capitalism can never resolve. And this is the contradiction. While it needs people to produce more because it wants to make profits, mm -hmm. it has to make sure that these people get lower and lower wages. Right? So while this wealth accumulates, more people have to become poorer. You're, you're accumulating wealth and accumulating products in hopes of having some people buy it. But how can you buy it if more people are becoming poor? And the gap, you ever hear the gap between the rich and poor is getting wider? Of right. course, because there's this contradiction that capitalism can never, ever, ever resolve. Because as it makes money, it makes more poor people. Who are going to buy these products? Nobody. That's why it gets accumulated. We're not arguing that there are no people in need of products. There are people in need of products. Can they buy it, though? No, because capitalism has to make sure they don't get paid enough. How do you expect a Chinese worker who gets 2 or $3 a day to buy Nikes they produce for 100 120 or even $20? You can't, because this... This contradiction is becoming wider and wider and wider. And plus, like, Americans are getting concentrated to, like, Kmart, Walmart, Target. You know, you look in the paper and you get the shirt at Target real cheap and you get it at Macy's real expensive. Who goes to Macy's anymore, you know? So right now, buying, like, 86%, cheap 86 we have to buy a lot of it every day. Well, and we can. 86% of all of the products produced in the world mm -hmm. come to 16% of the population which is the first world. So imagine if the remaining 84% only get 14% of that. Does that make sense to you? 86% of all products in the world come to the first world, which is 16% of the world population. The remaining has to be distributed among the rest. Meantime, for the first world, anyway. right, because production is disappearing, agriculture is disappearing, and um, there's so much uh, economic instability, even though, like, say, we're very rich in this country compared to just about anyone else, but our existence is changing, too, because we can't meet minimum safety standards with, like, health and housing, because we can't afford those things. Right. And at the same time... Well, in these... Poor countries too, they get Oh, right? yeah. But, you know, if like in the, the United States. The difference States, between the first quintile 
one tenth of a percent uh -huh. to the bottom one tenth of a percent in America in right. the nineteen seventies was one to seventy nine. Right. So right. the first quantile made one, the top made an income, seventy nine. Today that's increased to one hundred and seventy one. Wait, the top was it one percent or ten percent? Maybe seventy nine. One to seventy nine. Now it's one to one seventy one. Wait, the, but what what are the who made who, what was the seventy nine? Was the top what it was the top one one, one tenth of the top ten percent? Oh, it's ten percent. The way usually you look at income disparity, you compare the top ten percent to the bottom ten percent. Oh. In any in most countries, right? Okay. Top top ten percent compared to the bottom ten percent. Right? The larger the disparity over the years, the worse this is becoming. So we went from 1 to 79 to 1 to 171. And what was the 1 to 79 year? Uh, early 1972, 73. You, you can look up these numbers. I don't mean to confuse you with numbers. It's not confusing. It's interesting. I just had to Stephanie. I've, um, since a lot of production has moved away from the core countries to the periphery, and there's not, you know, there's much less industrial production going on here, you know, in a place like this. How do you, I want to get your opinion on how do people who live in the core country fight um, against capitalism and imperialism when production is largely not occurring here? Not occurring, not occurring there or here? Here. here. What is the best way to unite with the international proletariat? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't study that. I, this is, I studied up to this, up to this part. Can I respond to that? Uh, Daniel can answer that. Yes, because I'm actually in both front. I think one, there is need to be a, a, to a build an entire police movement in the United States itself. Uh, you, you talk about the contradiction between the rich and the poor. I think the, the notion of a poor country, we should not discuss it, that doesn't exist. Haiti is a, is a very rich country. Uh, we could produce anything we want. The fact is there is two reasons we are in that situation. The, the, the national, the dominant classes in Haiti that are anti-national, anti-popular, this is the main element. And the second aspect is the U.S. domination, imperialist domination on Haiti. So first, I think, one, we need to support any struggle that goes on in those countries themselves uh, in order to weaken the imperialist policy. Because the, the question of the condition between the rich and the poor people, it, it's not mechanical. In fact, just about three years ago, U.S. imperialists invested $200 million in Haiti to stop the wage movement, uh, the minimum wage struggle that, that was in existence. So it's, instead of giving those Haitian workers $80 a day, they, they spend the $200 million to stop it, so they could get $10 a day. Uh, so there is that struggle. We need to support their struggle. We need to support the working class, the struggle of the student in Haiti by organizing here in the United States. Uh, the second aspect is, is to you know, stop U.S. aggression, imperialism, into those countries. Because whether I used to say something when I was growing up 14, whenever a country you say an American flag, you know there is misery in it. <laughs> you don't even know, need to go land there, you know misery exists. Because that's what they do. And if you understand, for example, I'm taking Haiti again as an example. Uh, U.S. Empire's policy in Haiti was actually to put Haiti in, this, in this, the situation we are in today, so we could be totally dependent on them. They went to Haiti, they went and totally devastated the Haiti uh, since 19, the 1900s and the 1980s. It, um, that Haitian bubble was there, but there's another Haitian bubble there. They know, we know about the, the, the Haitian pig, what they did. They killed all the Haitian pig, which was actually a bank for the Haitian peasants. And then in 1972, they came with their free trade zone. And if you look at it in, in the 1960s, that's where the biggest migration of Haitian exists when they finish killing the Haitian pig. The Haitian pig, if I, it, it was like a bank for the Haitian peasants. 
is where the Haitian peasant grow that pig. When that pig becomes very fat, they'll sell it for 3500 This is that where, where they will send their kid to school, get their first daughter to be married. Well, what's in there? But they, I'm, I'm not talking about it. <laughs> Those are direct facts for me. In a sense that they kill all of them. And the next thing you see is the process of neoliberalism, the peasantry leaving the countryside and go to the big cities, and all living, taking a boat, coming here to the United States. So that we need to expose it. That's why there's an importance to have an entire imperialist movement in the United States itself to expose those conditions, to expose that reality that exists, where the policy of the United States to USAID, the World Bank, IMF, all those policies that goes into those countries and, and make, making them poor, because they're not, they're not poor, really. And, and also supporting, whatever the condition are, supporting the popular struggle that exists into those countries themselves. Uh, so those two have to work together in order to expose and to support the transformation. And then the more the transformation that exists in Haiti or in any other countries, the weaker imperialism will become. I agree. I mean, I, mean, I, I tend to think, Stephanie, more on, I don't think anymore that one country can liberate itself. I think it's regional and, and, and I, I say regional, I mean, not, it's international, but when you say international, I don't mean all of the world, but regional. Regions have to do that now, because... Yeah, no one country can do right. be right. independent from capital. Right. No capital, like, no individual here could say, I'm independent from it. Right. They're going to be um, forced into it somehow, so we, unless there's a progression of liberation that expands. Right, so you have to create a regional alternative, rather than, yeah, it's probably the most broad thing, I guess. What do you want to say, Jeff? Yes. Jeff, try and formulate it. I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how this support for struggle in other countries translates to translates practically in our country. We're not in those countries, and so it seems that the the process of supporting struggle, or in conjunction with these struggles in these other countries, what we're seeing is a decline in the quality of life in this country, a crisis of capitalism, and we have, and, and the tendency, the dominant tendency, is to fix capitalism, to, to, to reassert a way of life that, whereby we have a middle class in this country. And, and you know, in my opinion, that's not gonna happen because it's not possible, but still, that tendency predominates and it's gonna it's gonna carry on and on whereas we need to struggle actually against that tendency so I, I'm, I, don't, I don't know if I'm coming back. You, know, you are you are I mean, yeah. look I think because it's much easier to at least think about it. I was talking to a taxi driver in the Middle East just recently and I said to him why do you think that despite the intense conflict between state and people in the Middle East, people still choose the legal process. You know, sure, we'll go protest, but we want to change <coughs> structures legally. We don't want to destroy the government or get rid of the entire army and the structure and the apparatus. He said to me, <laughs> he said, because it's much easier to do that than give blood. And by give blood meaning dying. Yes. The cause. You know, so people want, and it's natural. I, I think it's human nature. It's not human nature to look for the violent mean. I, I seriously think that. So it's easy. Why don't we do it through the legal way? Way is because it's much easier. This is what this taxi driver was telling me. So, so when you think about the perpetuation of middle classness in in America, right? Which is what you're saying seems to be the alternative for most people, right? even leftists at times. It's because it's easier to, easier to do than a revolution or something that becomes violent, something, something that has to face you know, the, 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 the means of, what we call means of repression, you know, police force, military, what have you. 
And that's why I think people are tending towards that most of the time, rather than. Uh, and th this is a, this is not a political reason I'm giving you. The political reasons are there, and we can talk about it. But this is more of a, sort of a. I don't know, emotional, psychological, individual basis, mm -hmm. because people aren't organized, as you know. So people are worried about their everyday life, and the easier way to get to what they think is middle classness, which is what they think is happiness. Yeah. I just wonder what the, you know, what what would be the wisest direction our process of educating people should take. I mean, which way should we go? Do we educate people about the fact that capitalism, that we're done, it's done, you know, it's all over, the middle class is done, and and basically what we can count on is just seeing a, con a continuum. That's like telling telling a missionary there is no God. It's, you know, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's not really easy. To well, that's uh, I, I think I probably have a better shot with the the capitalism <laughs> argument um, <laughs> than the God argument. <laughs> At least I can point to material reality. Um, I think that I think we do this all the time, and rightly so. We come to this point of what do we do, um, and that in itself should be a, a, a meeting or you know a talk in itself. You should drink one circle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you, folks. This was lovely. I hope we learned something. Again, I have some posters.